We're going to be talking today about will college learning be transformed by technology? And in some ways it may already be transformed by technology, but we've got a couple of very good people to talk about this with us. But one of the things I wanted to do was the fact that I was at the reception yesterday and they talked about um, uh, have some fun, tell some jokes. I only know two jokes. One's inappropriate. <laughs> So I'm not going to tell that one. But this is other joke that I do know. And it's about this guy who goes into his office one day. And big, burly guy is wearing his wife's glasses, not quite like mine, but they are really very girly, feminine, frilly glasses. And they look at him and say, Bob, why are you? They were afraid to ask. They thought some, he had gone crazy or something. Why does he have his wife's glasses on? Finally, a coworker got up the nerve to ask him what was going on. And he said, she wants me to see things her way. <laughs> And so that's why he's wearing her glasses. Well, what we're going to do is try and see things the way of some brilliant people who are looking at life and college and education for the, for the now and the future. Um, let's tell you, let me tell you who we have with us. Joanne Weiss is the Chief of Staff to Education Secretary Arnie Duncan. You've heard of him, right? She joined the department in 2009 as Senior Advisor to the Secretary and Director of the $4.35 billion Race to the Top Fund. A lot of money you've been managing. Before that, she was partner and COO at the New Schools Venture Fund. This net lady knows a few things about education. And before that, she spent 20 years designing and developing technology-based services and projects for education. Next to Joanne is Andrew Ng. Uh, yep, Andrew Ng. He is Associate Professor of Computer Science at Stanford. With a name like Rahema, you can understand I'm a little bit um, sensitive about pronouncing people's names correctly. He is co-founder of Coursera, an education website offering free online courses from top universities, including University of Pennsylvania, Princeton, and Stanford. He's also the director of the Stanford Artificial Intelligence Lab. And I'm kind of scared up here, actually, because I don't know. He, he talks, I'm not sure what he's talking about, because it's artificial intelligence, I'm not quite sure. But the thing about what we can do today is, I think it bring, is bring this all down to the level of the users. Because we're here not to just talk about how this can affect you and I, but to a whole group of young people, and maybe people who want to go back to school, how they're going to be learning. And will technology have an influence on that? As we get started, Joanne, I want you to set the scene for us of what we are talking about. Who are the consumers in college, going to college, who we might be changing life for them as technology is infused into their education process? Yeah, let me, let me start by, by saying that given the um, the great credentials we have in this audience, I'm gonna to need to ask you, I think, to set aside your own academic and college experiences, and let me paint a picture for you of what's happening in most of America right now so that you understand the problem that we're really addressing and why some of the things that Andrew's gonna talk about could really be um, something that changes everything in higher education. So right now, here's the challenge we have with the pipeline of what's happening with our students. So if for every 100 kids that enters ninth grade, beginning of high school, let me tell you what happens to that pipeline of 100 kids. So 75 of them graduate from high school. Of those 75, 51 enter college. So we already have more than half of our population not even going to any post-secondary education at all. And we'll talk in a minute about what we know to be the sort of economic implications for those, for those 49 people. So those 51 enter either two-year or four-year, so some post-secondary college. And now what happens to them? 29 of them will graduate with an associate's degree, a bachelor's, or some kind of certificate um, or credential. And of those 51, 38% of those, so about 20 of those students, are gonna need remediation when they get to college because they weren't prepared when they got there. We have a whole topic tomorrow about K-12 that we'll be talking about why that's happening. That's another whole story. But they're coming to college without the preparation they need to do college-level work. And they're stuck in these remedial courses that do not bear college credit. And if these students don't get through these courses successfully, they can't go on at all. These are gatekeeper courses. If you're not ready for college-level work, you can't go on. 
And of those kids who go into those courses, it's almost a death sentence for them. Six of them will actually make it through those courses and into college level work. So we have a huge problem in this country where we know that the economy absolutely depends on people having college educations. Um, I'm sure you all know that the sort of unemployment statistics are pretty shocking, like high school graduates have if you only have a high school diploma, the unemployment rate is 8.1%, whereas if you have a college or a professional degree, the unemployment rate is down to 3.9%. If you're a high school dropout, the, the unemployment rate is over 13%. But what's even more telling is that if you just look at the new jobs that have been created in the last year, 96% of the new jobs created between May 2010 and May 20. Um, uh, between May 2011 and May 2012, 96% of them went to somebody with some post-secondary education. So even a high school graduate didn't get those jobs. You had to have some post-secondary um, uh, experience. So we're just in a position where college matters enormously. It's expensive. It's not producing the kinds of results we need. We're having a hard time measuring quality and enter new innovative solutions like the stuff that Andrew's doing. And you start seeing maybe a whole new way to solve some of the big problems that we're going to be facing in the 21st century. Andrew, that's a terrific segue to you in terms of the students who are entering college. Is it this time, are we in a, in a position of this is the perfect storm of economics and need coming together and creating a greater need for what you have developed in terms of how we teach college academics online? Yes, <clears throat> thanks for hearing that. And I think um, we're in this somewhat unique time where the convergence of societal forces that Joanna mentioned um, has led to, a, I think, a crisis in higher education. Um, and I think recently Tom Friedman in the New York Times wrote that is when what is desperately needed, what needs, what is possible, that, that, that that's when there is a revolution. So what is possible? Um, about a year ago, out of Stanford University, we launched three free online courses, each of which had an enrollment of like 100,000 students and up. Um, so I guess I'm a Stanford professor and I normally teach a 400 student Stanford course and last year I taught a machine learning class with 100,000 students in it. Uh, to put that number in context, in order to reach an audience of 100,000 students, I would otherwise have had to teach my normal Stanford class for um, 250 years. <laughs> um, and so there were many reasons why so many students came online to take these courses, but I think that for, for perhaps the first time in history, the technology now exists for a professor to teach not just 50 or 100 students, but to teach tens of thousands of students. And today we have uh, professors from you know, Stanford, Princeton, Michigan, Penn, soon other schools as well, um, offering free courses on the line for anyone to take. And I think given the desperate need, you know, both in the U.S. and outside of high quality education, I think if we can use technology to connect up any student with an internet connection, connect them up with the best professors in the best universities, I think we can transform the way that education is run in this country and worldwide. It makes me ask the question too, um, right off the bat, because I don't want to leave teachers out of this. Will the need for excellent teachers continue as we go into more experience around digital education and online education. Joanne, do you think that we will, we will find that we'll need fewer education? Will technology change the landscape of what it looks like to find someone who is providing the instruction? Will there be fewer instructors? So I think the answer is going to be very different in K-12 and in higher ed for this for a whole lot of reasons that have to do with developmental things as well as a, a lot of reasons. In higher education, um, I think that, that Andrew can explain a little bit about um, basically how they've taken the concept of TAs that we all know well and probably established a lot of close relationships with TAs that we knew and loved in, in our college experience. How do you take that sort of one-on-one -on -one thing that the TAs were meant to provide you in a, in a higher education setting and what do you do when the 100,000 students are spread all over the world? So I think there's some really interesting things that they're doing that will actually turn students into 
teachers um, and create peer communities that are going to be very, very valuable sources of support and instruction for one another. So Andrew, you might want to explain how that works. Um, sure. So let's see. You know what? So what made these online courses successful? I think uh, uh, why did we have a hundred thousand students sign up? Universities have been putting videos on on the web for a long time. I think one of the reasons was that these were real causes in the sense that there were homeworks with real deadlines, and if you miss a deadline, you miss a deadline. And as Joanne was saying, there was a community that was built up around each of these causes. Um, it turns out, for example, that if you have 50,000 students all working on problem set four, then no matter what time of day you're awake, uh, working on problem set four at 3 a.m., there will be someone else up, in, up at the same time in some time zone thinking about the same thing as you are that can help answer your questions. Uh, and so this means, for example, that on our discussion forums, when a student posts a question, the median response time to when a student asks a question was 22 minutes. Um, and this is a far better level of service than I was, I've ever offered my students. Um, <laughs> and, 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 to, and, um, and I think what Joan was alluding to was uh, peer grading mechanisms as well, in which if you want to have homeworks, um, homeworks is important because it's what allows students to practice with the material. Right? Students learn best not by passively listening, but by doing things and practicing with the material. And, um, and as part of that, in order to offer humanities courses, we've also put in place mechanisms for students to grade each other's work and to critique each other's work. Because that was a question I was going to ask you about. How does this translate into humanities courses? It seems like it's an easy um, answer for those STEM courses mm -hmm. where you just compute. But when you have to evaluate whether someone's idea and the way they express that idea is valuable, how does technology figure into that? Right. So yeah, I guess uh, uh, to, to, to Rahima's point, when we started out, we did only computer science education where multiple choice auto grading was relatively easy. Um, then a few months ago, we went to speak with uh, uh, Alpha Renz, who's the head of the University of Pennsylvania Writing Center, and we proudly showed him our multiple choice grading technology and said, Al, would you like to teach a poetry class using multiple choice? And he said, get out of my office. Um, <laughs> so based on that, we realized that we needed other forms of assessments to allow students to engage in more open-ended critical thinking, because university education is much broader than STEM. Um, in peer grading technology that we developed, what happens is you as a student would do a homework, maybe write a poem. Um, every student would then be sent to mini teaching assistant boot camp, training boot camp, where you'd be trained to grade other homeworks. After you've demonstrated that you're able to grade other homeworks, you'd be asked to grade maybe five other poems, and in, in exchange, you would get feedback from five other students. So when running this, it's been the largest peer grading exercise in history, I think, and uh, we now have tens of thousands of students doing work and submitting work and grading each other's homeworks, and it's been working very well so far. One question I have, or another question I have too, and Joanne, maybe you can start with this, of how does this, what is the real efficacy of this in terms of providing students with something at the end of the course? My understanding right now is that some of the elite universities are not offering college credit, but they might get a certificate. Is that what is, is most desirable for a student who's trying to think of taking that certificate and then going out and getting a job? I think there's like a couple big issues here that we still have to work through. I mean, this is, you're, you're hearing about something that's in, that's in its infancy. Um, we're in sort of year, what, one and a half of this kind of experiment of these massively online courses. Um, so there's a bunch of things to work out. One of the big things I think we still need to work out is, um, how we know you're you if we're going to give you a certificate and say that you have completed this course so that we can really make sure that it's valid that it's you who took the course and you who has the knowledge that that was um, that was being demonstrated the other thing is what is the what do these certificates mean so what's really going to happen what are institutions really going to do as they try to think about my brand my harvard credit is worth a lot. How do I reconcile that with my Harvard professor who's now teaching another course and what is he giving? Is he giving Harvard credit? At the moment, Harvard says no, it's not Harvard credit. If you're not enrolled in this institution, it's some other certificate. And you could imagine a bunch of different pathways that this could go. You could imagine eventually Harvard saying no, it actually is Harvard credit. You could imagine sort of a whole parallel structure uh, structure that, that crops up over the course of years. You've got sort of dollars and euros. You've got Harvard credit and you've got this whole separate badging system. And to the extent that employers and others really value 
what that badge says you've accomplished and say, I don't care whether you have the Harvard degree, the fact that you passed these five courses and you got a good grade is all I need to know, you're hired. You could imagine that currency taking on a whole new dimension and we could end up with structures that employers are dictating what's valuable and what's not instead of just universities. It has a lot of implications for accreditation and degree complete. It's, it's going to be interesting. It's a little bit the Wild West out there. And Andrew, I wonder, as we talk about, will college learning be transformed by technology? Do you envision that online learning will take the place of the traditional college experience, that students will then, in the future, the brick and mortar schools, the beautiful campus at Stanford and Harvard and Princeton, et cetera, that they'll just be places we'll come to for seminars? for yes. some best ideas, but we won't go there for the traditional kind of learning. Is that experience going away in your imagination? You know, so at, we, at Coursera, we've been asked that a lot. Uh, if, if Coursera is taking courses from Stanford, Princeton, and so on, and putting them online for people to take for free, why on earth would anyone still pay $200,000 for a Princeton degree? It's um, not a bad question. It's a good question. It's, not a, it's, 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 a, it's a good question. And here's, here's what I think. I think that the real value of attending a university like Princeton is not just the content. When in, in today's age, content is increasingly available for free on the web, whether we like it or not. And I think the real value of attending a place like Princeton is not you know, the opportunity to listen to the professor drone on for an hour or three times a week. Uh, you can get that on YouTube. Instead, I think the value is the interactions with the professor, the interactions with other equally bright students. So what um, uh, Princeton, Stanford, and so on are doing is increasingly experimenting with what's now come to be called the flipped classroom model. Um, Sal Khan popularized this, but the idea is that uh, Professors would record the content and put that on the web and ask students to watch the videos the night before. And what that does is that preserves the classroom time for more of the interactions with the professor and the student because the students can watch the lecture the night before in a format that ironically is even more interactive than a live classroom because you can you know, speed up things, slow things down, do quizzes online, and then they come in having learned the basic content so when they show up in the class they're ready for, a, um, for an actual discussion or small group problem solving or peer mentoring. And I think this is actually adding to the value of going to a place like Princeton or Stanford. So, but I think it's important to remember that the percentage of students, this audience notwithstanding, who went to Princeton, Stanford, Harvard, Yale, is minuscule. I mean, of all the students going to college, only 25% are even having a residential experience today. The rest are in commuter colleges, community colleges. They're not even having the you know, nostalgic experience that we all remember of our four years at whatever Ivy covered place we went. Um, and so I totally agree that there's gonna be a group of elite universities that still have a brand and a cachet and a way of preparing students that's gonna be incredibly valuable. But there's 99% of them out there that I think are gonna to have to really take this seriously and think about what it means to offer the degree that they're offering and whether there's a more cost-effective, affordable way to do it that serves students just as well. When you think about, uh, to Joanne's point, a university, I'm not picking on any university, but here is Dillard University in New Orleans. Here are some facts about the university. They have about 1,100 students, and the graduation of this fall, they graduated 157 students out of 1,100 in their total four-year population. A bachelor's degree, only 17% received a bachelor's degree after four years, 25% after five years, 28% after six years. On the co-ed status, 28% of those who graduated were men, 72% were women. This is a historically black college and university. Now, I want to know how does technology and online learning, does that translate into schools like Dillard, where you have a lot of students who are not in the elite category, but who are struggling in many ways from the statistics that Joanne mentioned from the very beginning. Not all of our students are going to be Harvard bound. Some of them are going to be going to Dillard, where the difficulties are enormous. Can online er learning, have you seen it, have an impact in education in universities like this? So I think for students that are a little bit underprepared, very often the um, online medium is even preferable to live instruction. And there's several reasons for this. <clears throat> One is, if you imagine, um, one thing I think a lot about is the notion of stereotype threat. This is uh, if there's a racial or gender minority um, that you know feels like 
my ethnic group isn't supposed to do well in school, <clears throat> so I'm afraid of raising my hand and asking questions and looking stupid, so I don't ask questions and therefore fall even further behind. Well, on the website, no one knows if you watch that video 20 times, uh, you can do that and keep on watching it until you get it. Um, no one knows if you needed to go and review prerequisite material, which you, had, you were supposed to have learned back in high school, but actually didn't. And no one knows if, uh, you know, if you need to post questions on the online discussion forum to get help from other students, you can do so anonymously. And <clears throat> I think um, with online education, we can also move away from the one-size-fits-all model of education because with content online, students can navigate the material in different ways. Students can review prerequisite material, can jump on to more advanced things that they're a little ahead of the class rather than forcing every single student to listen to exactly the same lectures by a professor. So various universities, including Stanford, are experimenting with these sorts of, uh, with this online medium to help, frankly, students a little bit less well prepared. And I predict that this will help us to raise graduation rates as well. We have a long history in this country of using technology to really support underserved and underprepared students. And we have a lot of data now that shows um, different ways that this can be incredibly effective. What we haven't had is cost effective ways and accessible ways of delivering it. And that's what I think this is changing. If it's free and if you have internet access, um, the dynamics and the economics start really shifting for people. And again, I, I wonder about achieving excellence online. I, I, don't wanna, I don't wanna lose that because I think that's so important. Your point was made, Joanne, about what employers will be looking for. And even in these colleges where, again, students are tremendously challenged, will the online experience give them an opportunity for, for that student where 40% of students enter, 38 to 40% of students enter needing remedial courses in English and math? Can they even afford still to go to college online and catch up to where they need to be in order to do that standard college uh, exercise. I guess what I'm asking is, um, do you really, really feel that this can translate for all students and not just the elite students? And will there be time for them to do it? So I think, um, let's see, I think there's an important role for instructors at all universities, uh, not just the so-called elite institutions, and that I think instructors provide a very valuable role, you know, at all, at all, all ranges of schools, um, perhaps using the flipped classroom to provide the one-on-one -on -one mentoring that students need. But I think if you can take the best content from the best professors at the best universities and make them available to anyone, um, I think this would give a lot more students the opportunity to really learn from the best educators. So you think this has the impact of being the great equalizer and not the great divider? When you look about who has technology in their homes, currently, um, I think the latest statistic is that something like 54% of African Americans have, have laptops and 51% of Hispanics versus 66% of white Americans have laptops, computers, PCs in their homes, but you would hope that a college student is one of those, is among those that has that computer. Or that your local library has them and there's other places that you can get access to them. I also don't think this is like about a student sitting by themselves at the computer. So I think teamwork, communication, there's a lot of things that we call now 21st century skills that are gonna be important here. So I also think we shouldn't think of this as just an isolating thing where you're sitting by yourself. We're really talking about a structure that builds community and where people might get together face to face. I mean, when uh, another, another group that spun out of Stanford is, is called Udacity, doing a very similar thing to what Coursera is doing. And in um, one of the courses that they just taught last year, there were more students taking the course in Lithuania than there were students at all of Stanford University. So like even in these remote places, there are entire cohorts of students doing this work together who maybe wouldn't have found each other but for the fact that they're taking this course and found common interests and get together and do study groups and organize themselves in all kinds of ways that involve community learning as well as individual learning. In those settings also, students found TAs who were local who helped them so they're still finding instructors. So I think we have to think of this in sort of flexible, blended ways. We don't know what that all looks like yet, but I think it'll be interesting to, to watch this unfold. 
Andrew, is that what you're thinking as well? Yeah, you know, I think the community aspect of it that Joanne mentioned is an important one. Um, so I guess in, in my machine learning class that I taught last year, you know, there were um, study groups popping up all over the world. I know that there was one in uh, Palo Alto, one in New York, San Diego, a couple in India, Hong Kong, Singapore, London. Um, every week there were 50 students in London me getting together for the study group to get together to study my machine learning class. And I think as these things organically arise around our courses, uh, we're increasing, we'll see lots of students you know, supporting each other in the learning of this material um, on top of the, the, the instructors being able to create and deliver the content online. And I think we're talking about lifelong learning here too. We're not just talking about 18 to 22 year olds doing this kind of thing. I think we're really talking about people over the course of their lives as the world is changing quickly, needing to have access to different kinds of education so that they can move their careers forward and in different directions. Um, you know, just sort of speaking from, from personal experience, my husband was a software engineer in Silicon Valley for 25 years and decided he wanted to completely switch careers and go into nursing for the last, you know, 20 years of his career. Went back to the community college, got his prerequisites, went to school, got his nursing degree, is now a nurse. That's America. Like, that's a very American dream. When we talk to our friends who are from other countries, they think it's insane. Like, you are what you decide. <laughs> you know, when you're 12, you're tracked into something, and that's what you are, and that's the way you think about your life and your pathways. The beauty of this country is we don't think like that. And we need to make sure that these opportunities really are open to people so throughout the course of their lives, they can take advantage of new skills, new things they might be interested in. And you know, most of the jobs that, that our kids are gonna have have not yet been invented. So there is gonna be a lot of change happening over the next you know, few decades. And this kind of opportunity will make that available to a whole lot more students. We talk about online education and there's a little place called University of Phoenix and Kaplan. And they've been doing something like online um, um, college education for some time. So I wonder, um, Andrew, how is this different from what we've seen in this country as far as people getting online degrees? How is what you're talking about in Coursera different from that? So I think the transformation we've seen, so here's some statistics. At Stanford University, um, the student-faculty ratio is about 20 to 1. Um, at the University of Phoenix, largely really an online university, I think the student-faculty ratio is about 24 to 1, so you know, not that dissimilar from, from a traditional older university at like Stanford. And the transformation that we saw starting about a year ago was these courses where the student-faculty ratio is not 20 to 1 or 24 to 1, but 100,000 to 1. And when you can do that, the economics changes dramatically when you can provide the technology to enable one professor to teach 100,000 students. Um, and I think that was, it's funny, when, when you look at education, education has been being transformed by technology for a long time because of societal forces like the cost of higher ed, the quality, the lack of access. But I feel like we're in a unique time where looking back, you can actually see when the inflection point was. And it was last year when we started to have these massive open online courses with hundreds of, hundreds of thousands of students. Um, and, and I think we're in a very unique point in history. Um, and, and thinking about you know, the top universities participating in, in, in these courses too, I think technology is transforming higher ed and none of us really know what the future of it will be like. Uh, but um, I'm glad that there's places like Princeton, Stanford, Michigan, Penn participating in this and leading the way that is these top universities shaping the conversation of higher education. Because frankly, if it isn't places like Princeton, Stanford, Penn, Michigan doing this, it may be other institutions without the high academic standards of these institutions, and that would be to the detriment of everyone. There's a little statistic that I was told about recently that talked about the fact that from 2002, um, there were about 1.2 million students engaged in online learning. Uh, most recently in 2010, over six million students are engaged in online learning. What I'm wondering about is, I have a nine-year-old son. He is a digital native. Will he do almost all of his college experience? What, do you, Andrew, suspect that that's going to be online for him in, in, by the time, let's say, 10 years from now when he enters a university? As we talk about, will technology change how we learn in college? Will my son not, leave? oh God, will he not leave home? <laughs> <laughs> That's a different panel. Yeah, is that, is that what you're telling me? 
Yeah, I, you know, I think many universities are using what's now called blended learning, where you have some things online, but also deal with a live instructor. I, I really think live professors add value, and it would be unfortunate if your son doesn't, uh, uh, you know, spend some Please. time with some exactly. professors. Um, and Joanne, do you see this as well? Do you see that, despite the excitement that's generated around this, there's a lot of energy, there's a lot of money generated around this, and there has been for some time. Do you see, are we really about to, to take this to the next dimension? We have talked about it for a while, but are we about to go where no college has gone before? I think everything moves slower in education than we think it ought to. So with that caveat, I think the answer is yes, we're moving in some, some fascinating new directions. We have to figure out how to measure quality and how to measure the value that you get. But one of the things that we know is that the cost of college has been rising at five times the median household income. That is just completely unsustainable. We have got to figure out different ways to provide education to many more people at much more affordable rates. And this has so much promise that I'm gonna be very surprised if it doesn't really take hold and start changing how, how we think about the problem. And economics seems to drive everything. It certainly does drive the news. <clears throat> and so, so, Andrew, do you think that that is the, the linchpin here, that as the economics of education, as the cost of getting a higher degree continues to accelerate, that will propel technological changes in the way we educate people in college? You know, I think, I think um, economics is certainly one major piece of it, and is also not the only one. Right. I think a large part of it is uh, just the lack of access uh, for any amount of money. I mean, in the ordinary course of events, most people will never have access to a Princeton class or a Stanford class and uh, love to um, give anyone in the world with access to an internet connection the opportunity to take classes from the best professors. Um, there was a story that really motivates me, which was some of you may have read about this in the New York Times uh, outside the United States. In January, at the University of Johannesburg in South Africa, um, regular admissions process had closed, and, uh, but there was a small handful of slots still remaining. So the, the, the morning before the university was going to open its gates to allow people to come in to sign up for these slots, um, thousands of people lined up, hoping to be first in line for one of these coveted slots. And when the gates opened the next morning, perhaps unsurprisingly, there was a stampede and uh, dozens of people were injured. One person, uh, a mother of a prospective student died. So that's a mother who literally died trying to find a better life, find a better education for her daughter. Um, and while stories like these, you know, are, uh, and, and, and maybe the unfortunate thing is that stories like these are perhaps not even atypical of the desperation and the great desire for people to give themselves and their families a better life through education. And today, most people just do not have access to online courses. And um, so perhaps no surprise when we started taking courses, when Coursera started taking courses from Stanford, Princeton, Michigan, Penn, and offering them to anyone on the world for free. Um, I think earlier this week, we broke 1.4 million enrollments uh, after, after having been signing up people for just a few months. And I think the demand for high quality education is tremendous. One other thing we've been seeing, um, what, what Rahima mentioned was, uh, the world is, I think, moving towards less formal forms of accreditation. I think a college degree is great, and also we've been seeing many students take these online courses and take their certificate from us, so we call them statements, and take the certificate from us and use it to successfully find better jobs, get raises, and so on. Um, so I taught a machine learning class. Machine learning is kind of a maybe esoteric computer science technology. But um, one of my, you know, recently I got email from a student, uh, Kenji, who was an engineer at the Fukushima power plant that had melted down about a year and a half ago. Um, he was a nuclear safety engineer, and he emailed me to tell me that he had been working on nuclear safety, but thanks to the class he took online with me, he continues to work on nuclear safety at Fukushima, but now using you know, machine learning techniques he had learned from me. And I think many students today are taking their certificates from us and certainly proudly listing them in their resume, and I think successfully using them uh, to get better jobs, better lives for their family, and so on. I mean, Udacity, one of the other organizations that I talked about that's a startup doing this work that also comes out of Stanford, their business model at the moment, and again, who knows how this will all unfold, but their business model at the moment is 
They take uh, the students who get the highest grade in the class, and with that student's permission, they market the resumes to employers, and employers pay them like headhunter fees. And they're making, they said if they have one, make 1% 1 of what a typical headhunter charges, they would have more than enough money to cover the costs of their entire operation. So there's all kinds of new ways that people will be thinking about how to like monetize this, and you can imagine that these students were delighted to have their resumes peddled to employers that that would value the skills that those students had just gained. Yeah. Before I open it up to questions, I have one, one, question, one question about how it might stay, change student behavior. Right now, I know of several college students who, during the school year, they don't get up before noon. Uh -huh. and, um, it certainly helps with that problem, doesn't it? <laughs> I, this, this might really address that problem. Uh -huh. This might be one of the reasons why this, this issue is being uh, pushed <laughs> forward, because they spend a lot of time awake at night not necessarily studying, um, but they don't get up in the morning. And Andrew, do you think that this is, well, particularly if they're going to be interacting with people who are on the other side of the world. If they're up late at night, this might be a good way to find a TA in, uh, in China. Maybe. So, you know, it's interesting. You, you, so what is the experience of a student like taking these courses? Let me, let me contrast the on-campus versus the online experience and the pros and cons to each. Um, in a traditional on-campus class, right, we've all been to classes like those, you sit in the classroom and listen to the professor drone on for an hour. Um, kind of like this. Kind of like this, actually. <laughs> and, and, and let me share something. So, you know, I, I, as a professor, I've been teaching like a 400 student class for years. Year after year, I walk into the same room and I say exactly the same words as I said the year before. I tell exactly the same jokes. Um, and but now you have one new one. <laughs> <laughs> And, 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 and we think about what happens when the professor asks a question, right? When I ask a question in class, um, usually about half of my class is still madly scribbling away the last thing I just said. Um, about 10% of my class is zoned out and on Facebook. And when I ask a question, usually there's that one, one student in the front row, the smarty plants, that just blurts out the answer. And then I, as an instructor, feel great that someone actually got it. Um, <laughs> And then the class moves on before most students have even had, had, had a chance to engage with a question or realize that the instructor that I had asked a question. So ironically, on the website, things can actually be more interactive uh, than, than this professor droning on. So a student experience logging in to, to an online ad to a Coursera or other website is as follows. Every week, you'd be responsible for watching some amount of videos. These would be 10 minute videos. You can watch them on the run, watch them, you know, if, if you have 10 minutes here and there to spare. Um, it's actually much more interactive because when a student, when a, when a professor asks a question in the video, you get a video of me talking, but when the professor asks a question, the video pauses and right there on your computer, your computer asks you a question which you get to submit an answer to and which you get instant feedback on. So rather than one student getting to attempt an answer, you, every single student, gets to attempt a question, every single student gets to engage in the material. Um, every week, you'd be asked to do a weekly homework. You know, you'd be asked to submit a, submit a multiple choice or something. And again, let's contrast this to the on-campus experience. Back when, back when we were in college, you know, I would learn the material, get the homework two weeks later, submit it two weeks later, wait another week for it to be graded and returned to me. And if, and if the student got 60 out of 100, you know, well, what can you do, right? You put it in your folder and the class moves on. Um, on the website, you don't need to wait a week for your homework to be graded. You need to wait one second for your homework to be graded. And so you get instant feedback on what you're getting and what you're not getting. And again, many pedagogical studies have shown that for many contexts, instant feedback is far superior to delayed feedback for student learning. Um, moreover, in a place like Stanford, we have the resources to grade your homework only once. And you've got 60 out of 100, the class moves on. But for a website where a computer has the patience to keep on showing you new questions and let you attempt the material over and over again until you get it. This is called mastery learning. And I think there's this idea that um, in university education today, what is kept constant is the amount of time you spend learning the material. What is variable is whether you master the material or not. And I think we should flip that. I think Sal Khan said this very profoundly. We should flip these two things. What should be variable is the amount of time you spend learning. And what should be constant is that everyone should get the material. So if you need to spend more time doing it, that's fine. Spend more time, but make sure you get the material in the end. 
Um, and the nice thing about the website is that the website has the patience to show you the video 20 times. And, 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 and but, you know, there's no human tutor, no matter how nice, that will not get a little judgmental if, if a student asks them to repeat the same thing 20 times. But on the website, it's just fine. And it's not only necessarily the same thing. I mean, ultimately, we'll have a lot of different ways that we'll be able to explain things so that a student who doesn't get it one way could watch something different or engage in a different activity in order to help maybe help them understand it in a new way. Um, so we're still at the beginning of this, where it still is, I think, mimicking the current classroom lecture situation more than it will three, four years from now as we start really taking this as a new medium instead of just sort of dovetailing off the current medium and figuring out what unique things we can do to really help students get there faster. Yeah, that's a question I wonder about. Yeah, in the audience, yes. I'd like to make what I heard of implicit questions explicit. Oh, we've got a microphone for you. <clears throat> Good morning. This has really been amazing and eye-opening. Thank you. I'd like to take the comments from Rohema and Joanne implicit questions that they had and make them explicit to you, Andrew. Uh, Joanne said 38% uh, need remedial help in moving into the higher learning situation. Rahema said in New Orleans, 6% actually uh, make it through. So you have this very large population of people who are at a very different level than reaching out to Stanford or Penn professors. They need a whole uh, different intervention scheme. Will uh, this excellence that you have talked about of professorship be available moving through the, the problems of remediation that they uh, were concerned about? I think absolutely. So Stanford University has recently been trying to create causes, uh, experimenting with using these to create you know, remediation of, uh, causes to help students that were less well prepared. I wish we could give everyone personalized access to a one-on-one, -on -one very best human tutor as we can. Um, I think there's a, we know from pedagogical studies that one-on-one -on -one personalized tutoring gives probably the best measured outcomes in student learning. But uh, and in fact, about 30 years ago, there was a seminal paper called The Two Sigma Problem by Benjamin Bloom, which showed that um, if uh, students attend a regular lecture, they attain a certain level of performance. If um, students are allowed to do mastery learning, meaning you keep on trying the material until you get it, the performance shifts up one standard deviation. And if you give them a one-on-one -on -one tutor, the performance shifts two standard deviations. The reason this was called the two sigma problem was because we as a society cannot afford to give every student a personalized tutor. But what I think we can do is afford to give every student a computer. And as the technology um, uh, evolves so that we can deliver more and more personalized tutoring to Joanna's point earlier, I think we can, um, I, think, I think the onus is on us, I guess, to put, put an emphasis on delivering the content and the lectures that are appropriate for the most needy students in our society. And I think, let me just add sort of a different spin on what you asked, because I think this is a great question, and it's one of the things that we at the Department of Education have talked about a lot. And one of the things that we've been struggling with a lot is what's our role in higher education? We are by far the biggest funder of higher education. We fund way, a way bigger percentage of higher education than we do K-12, but because it goes through students and not to institutions, we have very different levels of influence over how that money is actually used and what happens with it. And remedial education is clearly such a giant roadblock to so many of the students that we care most about that it's like a huge problem we need to fix. So as we look at our, our role to really spur innovation out there, one of the questions is whether we could do a competition or something that takes some of these things that are working so well for um, the more advanced students and challenge the world to come up with ways of really taking the instruction, the uh, research and applying it to accelerating remedial education for these students and really closing those gaps much faster and more effectively. I think it's a really important point. Sir, right in front. Thank you, John Dibbs, Palo Alto. Um, you mentioned, Andrew, the Khan Academy. It seems to me the answer to a lot of the remediation is the Khan Academy because he's so fabulous. He was here last year for people saw them, and I think that in, if the, if the students you know, can learn through that, then they can use Coursera and some of these others. My question on, on Coursera is in Tom Friedman's op-ed, he talked about what this other group is doing that actually 
connecting with employers and so on and, and giving a real validation to what you're doing. Have you had any success with that or what's your plan there? Um, yeah, so actually, yeah, let's see. So many students are using our certificates, Coursera certificates, to get better jobs, and a number of employers have approached us. Um, the thing that excites me about, you know, I, when, when I was, even before this was a company, while it was still a Stanford project, there was kind of one rule I put in place for the entire organization, which was that whenever there's any decision to be made, we do what's best for the student, figure out what's best for the student and do that, that's the end of it. Um, the thing that excites me about employer referral services is that I think this creates a lot of value for the students. Um, if you think about a student that may have graduated from a lesser known university, you know, if you apply, even a computer science degree, if you apply to Google, Facebook, and so on, even if you have a 3.8 GPA, there are hundreds of resumes just like yours, and it's difficult for your resume to stand out. But, my, but I think that if a student like that were to take a Princeton class, take a Stanford class, and do well, take a Michigan class, do well in these courses, I think that's a way for them to really distinguish themselves and attract the attention of these uh, uh, top recruiters. So it's something that we are actually uh, actively developing. We're gonna do one more here in the front row. Thank you. Uh, the question for Joanne, please. Do you think that this wonderful gift from these higher quality institutions that we have in America can be of help in segued into helping the 1,300 or so community colleges that we have in America? Yeah, and I mean, I think the community colleges that we have in America in a lot of ways are, are a real untapped gem because they're very tapped into what's happening in their local business communities. They often work very closely with businesses to design specific certificates and courses to fill pipelines for those companies. So this, and they are pretty innovative. I mean, they'll do these kinds of degree programs or certificate programs with businesses on a sort of constant ongoing basis. This is the kind of innovation that I think coupled with their natural propensity to partner in their community is going to really be a boon for them. Mm -hmm. Question here. Uh, yeah, Richard Noel, Duke University. So I have a question. I, I can begin to understand how the business model might work for a Coursera as a, as a company. And I'm wondering how it works within the university. So I imagine I'm a current university professor and I have my course that I drone on about uh, three times a week. And um, maybe I'm even inclined toward wanting to uh, move that to an online course like with Coursera. But how do I get credit for that within the existing institution? Um, how do I compensate for what I imagine is a pretty high level of upfront cost to preparing such an online thing, but it may have a, I may be able to then get, re, you know, repeat it again and again and again. So if I think about the 100,000, you know, the 100,000 to one ratio that you get with the online course, there's uh, also a, a, a cost side to that in terms of preparation. So how, how are you finding that works with, within the university for faculty or who are part of current institutions? So many professors are really passionate about what they do and, uh, and in fact many of the professors we're working with were often the leading scholars that had shaped their field. So when you go to say UPenn uh, medical school professor who has just invented some new life-saving technology, uh, we actually worked with a professor who invent, who's been working on a new way to uh, induce hypothermia for cardiac resuscitation, so putting someone's brain on ice after they've had a heart attack so they can um, survive for 45 minutes and then be revived later. So miraculous technology. But he gets invited to give a talk um, all, all, all over the world, and even if he were to travel 365 days a year, how many people can he really teach this sort of life-saving technology to? So, but when we offer him the technology that makes it easy for him to teach you know, as many people as have an internet connection uh, this life-saving technology, the answer, unsurprisingly, was an enthusiastic yes. So I think many professors are enthusiastic about just taking this and, and you know, reaching out to much larger audiences. Um, to your point about the economics, when we teach a class at a university, very often one of the largest costs is the grading. And with um, auto grading technology and peer grading technology, uh, this, there is a large upfront investment, but this is then amortized over many years as the lectures that you've recorded can be used over and over. And as the grading technology now takes away what is probably the largest burden, the largest manual effort needed to teach courses. Um, and moreover, you know, uh, uh, as Coursera monetizes, we will share revenue back with the partner universities as well, so that, so that the economics of it, I believe, will, 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 will be beneficial to everyone. Oh, right here.
MIT and Stanford, which are obviously um, institutions with a great deal of power and whose reputation, I think, can do a lot to drive interest. I don't know, for example, some of the numbers that have been offered for you know, enrollment. If those would be true of other institutions, also open up their doors. I'm, I'm just curious to what extent do you think the success is due to these institutions versus the new model? So I think the brand of these institutions, um, I think the fact that students are signing on to take a Stanford clause or a Princeton clause, I think that has been important because when a student you know, signs on to a Princeton clause, they know it's a Princeton clause taught by a Princeton professor and that the course has academic standards commensurate with the high academic standards of Princeton University. Um, I don't know that we need a thousand instructors all teaching Calculus 101 online, but having maybe 10 versions of Calculus 101, maybe even 50 online, that might be good for students. And so I think we'll have a growing number of universities but um, uh, putting these courses online. Um, I, I don't know that every single university needs to create, the, uh, you know, create an online course offered to hundreds of thousands of students. Um, I should say we are trying to grow the number of universities we're working with. Um, the, reason we, the main reason we haven't done so yet is that you know, we, could, we could only grow so fast. I've only had this much time to, to talk to different universities, but we are working on that. Uh, up in the back. I'm in discussion with several schools about creating an online course in the history of the U.S. Civil Rights Movement. I have two remedial <laughs> or primitive questions. <clears throat> One is a seminar model as opposed to a lecture model. A seminar model works best um, doable for this. It works best in the class room, but can that be translated? Number two, how much does, will the, good, will the elite schools be importers as well as exporters, do you think? of these classes? In other words, would Stanford give credit for a course that originates in Paris or at the University of North Carolina, as well as offering them? Because um, it, it's a question how much the originating institution matters as opposed to just the, the quality of the administration of the course. Yeah, so your second question for us, uh, there are actually universities starting to offer academic credit for some of these online courses. Uh, there was a, university, a couple of universities in Europe, a couple in the US that told their students, oh, go to the Coursera website, take this class, bring home your certificate from the Coursera website, uh, maybe do something extra, like write an essay on your experience or something. Then there were students getting local academic credit that is good towards a degree uh, for taking our courses. So this is happening a little bit already. Um, universities, we're seeing the top universities, you know, start to use each other's content. Uh, a little bit on their own local clauses, and I think this will grow over time. Um, and sorry, uh, seminar. Oh yeah, seminar courses. Thank you. So seminar courses is an interesting one. Um, so Princeton University is teaching a sociology class, Intro to Sociology, that has lecture components and also seminar components. I think the lecture component is the component that's easier to move online. For the seminar component, I think there's probably technology that needs to be invented and built yet, but isn't. But what we're seeing is that um, in the Princeton sociology class, it turns out in sociology there's great interest in hearing uh, what other people all over the world think of sociology. I'd love to know, you know what someone in Africa or China thinks about sociology compared to the US perspective on, on how people work. So what we're seeing is that there's actually been a very lively international seminar with students chiming in, uh, forming study groups and trying to, these, these really <coughs> study groups that span continents and students trying to hold a fascinating seminar that just could not have taken place if it were in only one university here in the US. There's a lady in the back, a uh, second from the back. Uh, if I could ask you to look in your crystal ball, um, given all the various things you've talked about, why do we need so many faculty and why do we need so many universities? If there's an excellent, whatever the state of the art online opportunity, what's going to be the fate of universities and faculty across the country, say, in another five years after these technologies are refined even better? Why not have the best calculus professor on the planet teach the calculus to everybody across the world rather than having several? 
I think professors play an important role, and I, I don't think the prof I don't going forward. I don't think the role of the professor should be to provide content. Uh, what do professors do now? We now deliver lectures, right? Well, where do lectures come from? Many of you might not know this. I think the concept of the modern lecture was invented about three hundred years ago, when there was one copy of the book. Um, then the professor owned the book. And the lecture was how the book was broadcast from the professor to the students. I mean, the professor literally stand there and read the textbook because that's how you broadcast this book. Surely we have better ways of broadcasting content now. Um, but I think professors do have an important role. Many students would benefit tremendously from one-on-one -on -one mentoring, from 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 you know small study, from um, small group problem solving with discussions with the professor. Many universities have been encouraging professors to move towards these more interactive models of education, but the biggest problem has been that you know you can schedule the classroom only for three hours a week or whatever, and that those three hours have to be used to broadcast the content because how else can students learn what they need to do, learn what they need to learn in order to do the homeworks, take subsequent classes, and so on. But now with online education, we can take the broadcast or the lecture component and put that on the website and then use the in-classroom time for these much more interactive things. Um, like just in time teaching, you know, where a professor looks at the statistics of what the students were doing on the website the night before, can see what questions, what uh, Q&A, what questions the students were getting wrong, and can then focus the discussion on what the students are confused about rather than lecturing on everything. So I think, I think professor's role will change, but I think it will, hopefully the professor's job will become more fun because we're now interacting with students rather than lecturing at them. And I hope it will become even more important because professors will now have the time to create even more value than they were able to previously. And Joanne, when you, when you hear that, the question and the response, does, from where you sit in the Department of Education and when you think about higher education, is that a model that you think is, is even workable going forward, that one professor would, one for the masses, as opposed to many for many? I mean, I don't think we're going to have control over this. It's, the market is going to evolve the way the market evolves, and I think it's a good question, and we don't know the answer. I do think five years is too soon. Um, but I, I think that this is a good question. Will it look like what Andrew described? Will it look like just, you know, the one great professor owns the entire planetary market? Or will there be cottage industries that spring up where you can buy local one-on-one -on -one tutoring and support to help you get through the course, but there is still one great guy who taught it? I, I, I'm not sure what it's gonna look like. The world has not unfolded yet. The lady in the back. Jerusalem, um, Bezos Scholar. So don't you think online learning might be a disadvantage for students who have uh, poor time management or who are not serious on their academics? Yeah, I, I, I think you're right. That is one of the challenges uh, for students that you know, haven't gotten into the habit of sitting still in front of a computer. Um, it, it, it can be challenging. I hope that the technology will improve so that we can even help those students along. Um, who's to say that the website cannot be more interactive and more engaging than a professor droning on? I mean, one of the most fascinating ideas has been gamification. Many of these students that have a hard time sitting still doing their work will happily spend hours and hours or days and days you know, playing World of Warcraft or whatever because uh, the designers of games have managed to make these things fun. I think the technology will improve. Um, uh, you know, maybe students can earn badges or earn stars or have online communities where you not only get to take classes but interact with discussions with people all over the world you know, via, via chats or what have you. And maybe the technology will even be able to help these students more than we can um, uh, with the, you know, with, with the boring, uh, with the hour-long lectures today. Having said that, this is part of why I think uh, live instruction or professors and TAs still have a, have a large important role, which is that when we can use their time to provide the one-on-one -on -one mentoring. I mean, I think Joanne mentioned community colleges. I see in California that they provide amazing student services, and I think universities can now focus this time on pro providing those services at a much better level to these perhaps most needy students. We also have to always be asking the question compared to what? So one of the big problems that underprepared students have right now when they go into college is it is vastly different from what happened to them in high school. No one's taking attendance. No one's making sure they do their homework. If you don't do it, you don't get credit. And it's really hard. So the student who doesn't go in with study skills, time management skills, initiative, discipline, they're really at a disadvantage right now. So you could imagine that 
also schools might start specializing in certain kinds of programs and students that they know how to help get through in a way that today no one's particularly incented to worry about or, or pay attention to. So that's a, that's a problem today and we have a long way to go to fix it. Um, on this side of the room, um, does anybody have a microphone or you just want to stand up? Oh, there you go, gentleman right there. Joanne, how, how does what's going on in, in uh, higher education translate to K-12? It's, it's different and it's different for a variety of reasons. Um, K-12 has a whole lot of developmental, you, know, you have to be developmentally appropriate for you know, kids who are four years old up to 17 years old. So we have a lot of issues um, around what works uh, developmentally for kids at different times. We also have custodial issues. Parents need to drop kids off someplace. So you need a physical place to have your kids go every day. So the place-based notion that schools are is, exists for a whole lot of reasons in addition to learning that aren't gonna go away. Um, and then K-12 isn't a marketplace the way higher ed is. Higher ed is still kind of an odd marketplace also, but it's got more qualities of a market that are gonna be, um, I think, subject to these kind of innovative forces in a way that K-12 is very resistant to. So how change unfolds in K-12 because of that looks and will look very different. Um, and that, that's what, the topic for tomorrow's conversation. I you think. should join us. We're, <laughs> we're gonna really rock and roll tomorrow, as we have done today, talking specifically more about higher education. Uh, gentleman in the back, yes? Uh, with all this online learning, are we going to end up with a generation that is unable to communicate through writing or verbally? I don't know. Can you read text messages? Are you... Who's going to who's <laughs> okay? who's okay? grade that? Who's going to grade that is the question. Yeah. So let me, I, I briefly mentioned peer grading, but I think let me, let me explain it better. Um, so I think, you know, uh, I think university education improve uh, important comp component of education is the writing things that you mentioned so how do we grade that um, with peer grading mechanisms which were set up what students do is they will write an essay and then be trained to grade others essays and then every student is required to grade other people's work and in exchange they get feedback from several other students on their work uh, pedagogical studies of education studies have shown that peer grading um, results in grades that are about as accurate as that assigned by a highly trained teaching assistant. These were education studies done in relatively small classrooms, you know, classrooms of 50 students or something. It turns out that um, even self-grading, if you're asked to grade your own work, that is also extremely accurate, actually even more accurate than peer grading, so long as the right incentive mechanism is put in place that you don't just assign yourself 100% every time. Um, and so recently we've developed these ideas out on the website, so we have you know, tens of thousands of students participating in these peer grading experiments, and so far the data says that the peer grades we're getting are you know, similar to the previous studies done in much smaller cases, but the data says that the peer grades we're getting are high, very high quality and again about as accurate or even slightly more accurate than that assigned by a single um, highly trained teaching assistant. I, I want to mention also robo graders. The other thing we get asked is, you know, right now I think the SAT written essay is graded by one human and one robo grader. Um, and uh, the robo grader score you know, correlates or is as similar. The robot grader school agrees with a human grader as much as two human graders agree with each other. Um, that's another interesting technology direction. At Coursera, we've actually steered away from that for now because I think robot graders today can assign a numerical score, but for a student to say your essay was a, exactly, for a student to say, you know, your, your essay was a four out of five, that's, it doesn't create a learning moment, whereas I think uh, having actual feedback and suggestions for how to improve, I think that's important to, to create the learning moments that allow students to improve. So again, this is the idea that grading and homeworks is not just about evaluating students, which is what you know, the SAT needs to do, so RoboGrader does great for that, but to give students meaningful feedback that allows them to improve, I think peer grading, at least for now, I think is the more promising technology. I think One last, also, oh, Joanne, I was you go just going to add quickly. I think we also have to remember that 
the value proposition in these courses is the thing that I think is still sort of under development, but to the extent that the value proposition in these courses is that employers value the skills that you gained, employers need you to be able to write, they need you to be able to work in teams, they need you to be able to collaborate worldwide. Your team might not be in the cube next to you, they might be um, in a, you know five different time zones where you're trying to figure out how to have a conference call without somebody being up in the middle of the night. And these are actually skills that you could build into this kind of structure structure in a really meaningful way, but we have to figure out what quality looks like and what we value here so that we're really teaching the things that, that we value the most. And I'm not sure we're there yet, but I have a feeling that you know text messaging is not going to be the thing we're going to value in the end here. One last question over here. Hi, uh, Castro Homai Fair, Bezos Scholar. Um, I was wondering some of the ways that you guys can uh, regulate and um, observe the academic integrity of students taking these online classes. Um, while it's on a lower education, uh, in high school setting at least, I've, I've observed that students often um, receive a good grade in the class, in online classes, but they take them just to avoid a tough teacher or class, and they don't learn anything at the end of the year because they've just been opening new tabs uh, throughout the online class. So I was wondering ways that we can uh, regulate that. I'm not sure if it's regulation that is the issue there. I mean, we do the standards for what's happening in a lot of those classes in K-12 is not what it needs to be. I think one of the things that Andrew's trying to argue is if you have the premier universities in the country teaching these courses, they already have a standard that they're setting, that they're holding everybody accountable to, that's a really high bar. And that alone is a really great sort of first entry out the chute. That's the, that's the bar that you want people to have set in their heads, as opposed to a lot of the courses right now that you're talking about in K-12, which set a sort of very low bar and are about escaping, as you said, some teacher they don't want to take a class from. Andrew, you want to have a final word on this? Um, I think, I think you know, these top universities have very high academic standards, and I think you're alluding to cheating, is that right? And I think right now we ask our students to agree to an honor code, uh, and right now the technology is immature, but um, there, are, there are various organizations, us and others, working on uh, technology to prevent cheating, to look at two essays and see if this was plagiarized, two computer programs, see if this is plagiarized. Or uh, to take or, your final exam in a proctored setting where you've yeah. produced an ID. I mean, there's a bunch of, you know, sort of low-tech and high-tech ways to solve this, but we have to address those courses if these credentials are going to be meaningful. I mean, the cheating problem, if these credentials are going to be meaningful. Yeah. Yep. Lots of questions, lots of issues. Please, would you thank our panelists? They have been terrific. And you as well. I really thank you for your participations. Your questions were probing and on spot.